So basically the book is subtitled Political Theology after Carl Schmitt. So I think I have to start by saying, well, who is Carl Schmitt and what is political theology? And then I get to the point of the book. So Carl Schmitt is sort of an infamous figure for the, I'm sure you, you, you're familiar with that, with that name, but nonetheless, for those who aren't, he's a infamous jurist um, that uh, got very involved at the beginning of the Nazi time with Hitler's sort of democratic, quote unquote, accession to power, which of course then he proceeded to um, do away with the constitution and everything else that's democratic. So he's, he has this very negative reputation and he was put on trial after the fall of the Third Reich, but he, he, did, he, he did not go to jail, but he was prohibited from teaching afterwards. Now, the funny thing is that uh, despite this, or perhaps because well, it's, it's unclear, this reputation, uh, in the last 20 or 30 years, uh, he has become extremely famous uh, to the point that now he's considered a classic in 20th century jurisprudence, and perhaps might turn out to be the most famous uh, jurisprudential mind of the 20th century. The reason, part of the reason of his leap to fame in later years uh, has to do with a turn in liberal democracies towards uh, emergency powers. Uh, we saw that after September 9-11, we've seen that in the war against terror and then the war against drugs, and now of course the war against COVID. So wherever emergency powers become a normal path for liberal democracies to deal with emergencies, everybody goes, goes to Carl Schmitt because that, that is a, in, in a certain way the essential, one of the essential things that he uh, uh, thought about, right? Uh, so that's the situation we're in. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, Carl Schmitt uh, was not only a thinker of emergency powers, but he also created this discourse, which is called political theology. He, he, he gave it this name. Now, political theology also was something that was really unheard of. Even when I was in graduate school, no one worked on political theology. It's now become also quite uh, fashionable. The reason it's become fashionable again is because in the last 20 or 30 years, as, as really, I know you're all familiar with this, it's a, it's a part of the core studies at ADI, we have the so-called return of religions, public religions into the public sphere. And as a reaction, the development of what's called post-secularism thought, that is a critique of narratives of secularism, according to which if it, even the Marxist or the Weberian sense the rationalization of life in modern societies and also the democratization of life in modern societies would lead to the eventual disappearance of religion. Now, this apparently is not happening, never happened, <laughs> might never happen. And so obviously uh, we have Carl Schmitt's attempt to say through political theology that in the West, politics has never really been thought independently of theology. And therefore it's a massive Political theology is a massive discursive critique of the 19th century secularization thesis. And it has been adopted by liberal Democrats uh, like Charles Taylor and Jürgen Habermas, who um, compose what we call post secularism. That is, they're not political theologians or they don't want to be grouped with Carl Schmitt, but nonetheless, they think that the 19th century idea of a completely neutral state. Uh, of uh, politics as being totally secular has become extremely problematic nowadays. So the book is really trying to uh, address uh, this, uh, this shift. Now, so let me go qu very quickly, what is political theology? What are the main ideas there? The first thesis right, of political theology is that all modern legal and political concepts are secularized versions of theological ideas. Now, if this is correct, if Schmitt's hypothesis is correct, this is a knife to the heart to liberalism because liberalism lives or dies on the conception that there is a possibility for the state, for law and for politics to have a neutral stance vis-a-vis -vis, uh, religious traditions or religious values. If, the, if what Schmitt is saying is correct, then that is not the case. Then the liberal democratic neutral state will be some kind of transformation of a Christian state. And this is where in post-secular discourse, Schmidt is used to attack uh, in a certain sense, the pretension of neutrality on the part of the state uh, by, for example, Talal Assad, who said, well, it's, it's actually a Christian narrative, therefore it's not really independent of religion and so on and so forth. 
That's why it's very important. Now, uh, out of this secularization uh, thesis, that is that all political concepts are secularized forms of theological concepts, there comes actually a research agenda, which is what, how I interpret properly political theology. And the research agenda is to study uh, in an, as objective way as possible, the analogies between theological concepts and legal concepts. So the back and forth of conceptual, uh, uh, of concepts or conceptions from the field of theology to politics and law, but also vice versa, as I show in the book, from politics and law back into theology. So that's, that's one thing. The other question is that for Schmidt, political theology was essentially based on one fundamental analogy, and that's the analogy between God and state, where the state is somehow the representative of whatever God is. Now, the big question is that is a secondary one, which is who or what represents the state as representative of these transcendent values, which we call God. And here, of course, the big distinction is, is it the king? That was traditionally the idea of monarchy was that the monarch was somehow closest to God and therefore the representative of the divine, or is it the opposite in a certain sense, that is all of the people. And here, Schmidt thought, and when he formulated political theology, he cited always on the side of the monarchic interpretation of this analogy between God and state, that somehow the leader, one leader, one king, one something, was the one-to-one -one correspondence to God. And this somehow legitimated their power. But uh, what my book is about is really the opposite way. That is that after Koshmit wrote, um, political theology was adopted by democratic thinkers. And there, their task was to show that somehow not a monarchic or leader or authority figure was the representative of God or divine values, or whatever you want, but actually the democratic people was. And that's why political theology after Schmidt means the use of this political theology uh, discourse to democratic ends. That's what my book is talking about. Now, the second aspect of why political theology is very important turns around the concept of legitimacy. Now, legitimacy is actually a very difficult idea, and we use it all the time. We legitimate this, is this legitimate, is that legitimate, and so on and so forth. But actually, the way Schmidt worked on it, uh, he understood legitimacy to be something different than legality. So in our liberal democracies, we tend to think that the legitimate use of power is just the legal use of power. But that is not what Schmidt was talking about. He was talking about, is it legitimate to use power beyond the limits of the law? As, for example, we might need to to deal with an, emer an, an emergency, an emergency power. And uh, you know, we all know that the state has a clean face because uh, it doesn't want to scare the citizens. And then it has uh, its dirty hands, right? Uh, of course, uh, drone hits and whatever you want now. Uh, and a couple of op-eds in the New York Times about America's eternal war in the last couple of days. So Schmidt was, uh, was of course a realist. He, he knows how states operate. So his question was like, okay, we're not so interested about you know, is it legitimate for the state to have the rule of law? And so that's obvious. That's obvious. The, the real question is, is it legitimate for the state in order to protect whatever it needs to protect to go beyond the law, to use emergency powers, to do things, to dirty its hands, if you wish, uh, that we would not otherwise normally accept? And that's the question of legitimacy. That's the question of legitimacy. So the question of legitimacy is always the use of power beyond legality. That's where it becomes a question. Okay. Now, some jurists, the most famous of them all was Hans Kelsen, the father of legal positivism. He attacked Schmidt for this distinction between legitimacy and legality. He thought that any, any use of the state which is not law-bound is illegal and should be prohibited. That's, in a way, I'm very sympathetic to Kelsen. But history has turned around against Kelsen. And what we have here is a normalization of emergency powers, whether in authoritarian regimes or liberal democracies, which of course are very key to adopt Schmidt's reasoning behind why we should legitimize beyond the normal rule of law, these kind of actions on the part of the state. So that's where we are, that's, that's what legitimacy really means, okay? Uh, it's, it's not a neutral term, it's not um, something you can just take out of the dictionary and say, what is legitimacy? It's, it's a real, when you use legitimacy, it's a tricky, it's a, 
it's a, it's you using dynamite there. You have to be very, very careful. Or otherwise, and that's what Schmidt was banking on, you'll you'll end up swallowing a hook and everything else uh, and going towards his kind of understanding of legitimacy, which is political, theological, and so on and so forth. And I think we, we have in great part. Now, so the question then of political theology is really about legitimating rule and rule and the state in, in the sense of its, you know, uh, let's call them emergency powers, not, not the typical stuff, but also the legitimacy of war in Karl Schmitt. As you, as you know, he defined the political, the concept of political as uh, the ability to decide between friends and enemies and therefore the ability to wage war against uh, other uh, uh, associations, uh, other political bodies. Um, so legitimacy also carries carries that uh, uh, aspect, right? Uh, uh, who is the who can legitimately start a, a war? Now, the way that Schmidt un understood this, he was thinking very much against the polar opposite field of anarchism. So, for anarchism, basically all law and all state power is illegitimate. That's the radical anarchist position. We should do away with all of it. But that means anarchism consequently will espouse a form of atheism. At least that is what historically happened with the great anarchists in the 19th century, was Bakunin, Dostoevsky, whatever. They, you know, there was a kind of a critique of the state and therefore also the analogy between state and God and the critique of God or atheism. So for Schmidt, it's obvious that if, you, if you're going to defend the legitimacy of war and power, then you're going to have to go towards a theological discourse. Otherwise you go in the direction of anarchism, which is of atheism. So anyways, th these are the, I'm just setting out the basic polarities. Third issue with political theology and the idea of legitimacy is that it's tied to representation, to political representation. So the legitimate actor in politics is someone who fundamentally represents all of society. They have to be a representative figure. And here there is a very big debate in political science or um, political ontology, which is, okay, representation is obviously central to politics, but there are two ways in which you can be representative of a society. One way is you're the imminent representative of society. That is your leader or your party or whatever that represents society because somehow you've come up from the grassroots and everyone or everyone in society sees you as representative from the bottom up. Now, Schmidt didn't believe that was possible. He didn't believe that was possible because the conflicts between social parts, social parties, people are too many. There's just never going to be a bottom up uh, uh, legitimation of authority or of power. Um, that is possible, like in a democratic system, but only secondarily, once you have coalesced a people or a nation or whatever you want, around the representative figure, which then cannot be representative in virtue of being imminent, bottom up, but has to be representative top down, that is in, in virtue of representing something that is transcendent. Now, you're all aware of sociology and you know Durkheim and so on. Uh, so Schmidt was, of course, very aware of all this. And, and basically, you remember that Durkheim for Durkheim, the reason why religion exists or totemism, all forms, is basically because they represent, there's something, religion represents all of society, this, this totality of society. And that is what, in a way, uh, Schmidt is harking back to. That's, in a way, what political theology is also appealing to, the sense that the legitimate representative will have to have a dimension which is theological or religious uh, for the very reason that uh, they can represent all of society only by appealing to some sort of transcendent. Uh, source. Now, the way that Schmidt uh, articulates this representation uh, from up down is through the concept of sovereignty. So the real representative of a society will be the sovereign actor, whoever is sovereign. And whoever is sovereign, then he defines sovereignty as the capacity to declare a, a state of exception to normal laws, right? And therefore to be able to use these emergency powers and so on and so forth. If you don't have anyone who's capable of doing that, then you don't have a sovereign figure in society. Now, of course, uh, from England, the English pluralist tradition immediately objected to Schmidt says, do we need sovereignty? Sovereignty never has existed. No one has ever uh, 
had sovereignty in the history of the world. So why do we need it now? And that is a very good question that we can discuss later. But, you know, everybody throws around the word sovereignty. So in a way, when we do that, we are buying into a kind of, you know, Schmittian narrative. Uh, I, that's not necessarily my position. Uh, uh, I think it is possible, in fact, necessary to think of politics without sovereignty. Uh, I personally think, and in my work having to do with republicanism, that that is the essence of republicanism. Uh, but this is not a book about that. It's a book about Schmidt. So I'm just bringing it up. And of course, the, the final element, given all what I've said before, the, namely the legitimacy of an absolute moment of government or rule, which leads to the legitimation of war, uh, which is tied to a up bottom, top down representative function of the leader, which appeals to some religious transcendence which uh, realizes sovereignty and uses states of exception. All of this, of course, in the 30s, when he was working this out, late 20s, 30s, coalesced into uh, the kind of fascist uh, Nazi leadership that we now associate with totalitarianism and, and certainly with authoritarianism. You, you're aware of, the, of course, of the post-war debates. Is something totalitarian? Is something authoritarian? What's the difference? And so, which are very much come back, right? In, in the wake of uh, what um, Keen, uh, John Keane uh, calls the new despotism, right? That, that a lot of you are, are studying and so on and so forth. So, so Schmidt is still with us because authoritarianism is still with us. And just think about Trumpism and what is that too? Uh, uh, because in a certain sense, populism is related to this, of course. And so, so this, this, this accounts for his... Uh, uh, not only survival, but as becoming a, a, a crucial uh, thinker. Apparently, he's extremely carefully studied right now in uh, China. But that's a different thing. That's that's a different thought of Schmidt after the war. But that's not what my book is about. Okay, so uh, how much time do I have? Okay, I have a maybe. I thought of doing this in about half an hour, Issa, and then we can open up. So uh, I'll take another. Um, you have another, uh, another ten minutes. Go on. Yeah, I have another 10 minutes. Yeah. So basically what I've been doing is <laughs> it's throat clearing for the book because this is just the first chapter of the book is explaining what the issue about political theology is. And afterwards comes my real thesis. And the real thesis is that interestingly enough, despite the fact that political theology was coined by Carl Schmitt, that it was initially adopted as a way of legitimating, let's put it, this is authoritarian, and then totalitarian governments. At the very same time, just about a, just a few years after he publishes political theology, the term political theology and the discourse of political theology is adopted by democratic authors in order to try to legitimize democracy against the oncoming totalitarian wave. So the book is really about, is a democratic political theology possible, okay? Now, a lot of people would say that democracy doesn't need political theology. Um, and, um, and that means, in a way, what you're saying is that democracy does not need a discourse of legitimacy. Now, I, I happen to be rather sympathetic to that view, but it is a view that is not generally accepted because we're all talking all the time about democratic legitimacy. And we are not aware that by talking about democracy, as so entwined with legitimacy, we have actually entered the discursive space of political theology. Habermas is a lot to blame for this, by the way, when he writes his famous book in the late, in the early 70s, The Crisis of Legitimacy. He thinks democracy is no longer legitimate. And so we, ha we have to somehow legitimate it. And it becomes very anxious about this. I mean, of course, he's right in a way, because as we see now, it's very unclear whether democracy is, is legitimate, as if everybody would say yes. Most, a lot of people in the world are saying no. There, there are other regimes that are better at solving this or that crisis, this or that emergency. Who knows what climate change will bring? We, who knows what kind of emergency powers we'll need? And so on and so forth. So is that a real debate? Of course, it's, it's pushed a lot. Uh, this is the line, uh, uh, of course, that, that uh, Xi and Putin love, uh, right? And that's why Schmidt is so important for them, right? Um, but so the question is, the basic the question is, you know, okay, if democracy needs to be now legitimated, uh, then, uh, uh, then we have to adopt a certain 
political theology, but it has to be a democratic political theology. Is it possible? What is it? Well, that's what my book is about. And so um, then I deal with the people who came up with this strategy to try to democratize political theology and, and what, how they did it. And I'll just run through the, the answer to this, basically, as I see it. So the first one to do to, to see that something like this was, was important was a guy called Fögelin, Eric Fögelin, um, who was Austrian. He was a student of Kelsen uh, and then immigrated to the United States. He, not very red. Uh, he wasn't very red at all. He was a marginal figure until um, Hannah Pitkin wrote a very famous book on the concept of representation. What is the representation about? And she began that book with a first chapter dedicated to what Fögelin had to say about representation. No, still, nobody paid any attention. And it was only really in uh, the last 10 years when in political science has been a so-called representational turn or a representative turn, is all of a sudden political scientists yet again start to scratch their heads and think, well, what, what are we talking about with representation? How many kinds of them are there? And so on and so forth. It's such a crucial concept. And that's when Fögelin's idea starts to come back. Now, Fögelin adopts Schmidt's idea that uh, if you're going to have a political system, this political system must claim to represent society as a whole. But it cannot do so merely electorally because it already presupposes any election that is the people who is somehow active in electing the leaders. But the question is, how do you get a people? How do you represent a people? And this question has become very famous with Laclau, of course, uh, and is in a way at the basis of, uh, of discourse theory and so on and so forth. And I, I, I do get into Laclau because Laclau, I knew Laclau very well. He didn't steal, but let's say he borrowed generously from Fergling without ever really giving due credit. But Fergling's idea therefore was that in order to have a political society, you need to have a symbolic representation of the people. But unlike Schmidt, he did not say that the sovereign, the leader, the authoritarian figure, however you want, is the representative of the people. In fact, he argued exactly the opposite that no political leader could ever be the legitimate representative of the symbolic whole called the people. So who were then these symbolic representatives? And this is where Schmidt says that actually the symbolic representatives of the social whole are not politicians, but they're rather philosophical and theological figures. And the reason why these figures are so important in a truly representative society is that, and this is where he coins this term borrowed from Bergson, they open society to a transcendence that would otherwise be closed in if we allow the state to represent everything that is of transcendent value. So he was obviously arguing against the Soviet Union, but also Nazi regimes where the state, Hitler and so on, Stalin, they were God in a way. So he's saying that's a closed society. So to open society, we have to admit that the political system cannot possibly represent the social whole. And other representatives have to, are better at representing the social whole because they open it up to transcendent sources of values without which we end up uh, with the Holocaust and we end up with all kinds of atrocities. Uh, so this is a very interesting argument, but it's a very double-edged argument. Uh, okay, because it's also saying that no, there is no political representation of the people whether it's democratic or not, right? Um, and and it's, it, it, it brought into circulation this idea of the open society. And nowadays, I mean, you can't be a Democrat unless you're, you're not advocating open society. But my book is trying to show you, you know, look at what you do, look at what the things that you bring up. You know, this is a, this is a very political theological concept, the open society. Uh, it would then become very famous, uh, the open society motif, not through Fergelin, interesting enough, but through uh, a pauper who adopted it uh, also in part from him uh, in, uh, of course, um, the whole, uh, now I'm forgetting his name, uh, Soros, Soros, right? This uh, Hungarian uh, philanthropist who, who basically uh, 
try to push the transition away from closed societies, you know, post-Soviet Union societies in Eastern Europe by setting up all kinds of open societies, right? And now there's the backlash of anti-Semitic and very right-wing uh, attack on Soros, right? From Hungary and from, you know, and from all these places, really. Uh, they want to be more of a closed society, it's looking like. All right, so that was just a chapter on Ferguson. So that, that's, you see how he's trying to deconstruct this category of representation in a more democratic sense, but also in a tricky way. The second chapter instead is dedicated to the, the other guy who is a little bit, who tried to take political theology in a democratic uh, uh, direction, and that is Jacques Maritain. Now, Jacques Maritain is a contemporary of Schmidt, and he's, he's best known, right, as the, as the, let's say, the philosophical father of uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Uh, he was in the thick of it to come up with the idea, uh, wrote parts of it, was basically the intellectual force behind, behind this, ultimately. And um, what he said is that uh, a political theology of democracy is, is necessary uh, because democracy is based on a faith, a faith. And what is it based on a faith? It's based on a faith in human rights, that these things exist, that we can implement them, that they should govern politics, not just at the national level, but at the international level. That's basically the faith of the whole United Nations system and uh, you know, a multilateralism afterwards. Now that faith is being tested these days. That's why it's interesting to go back to the people who first put up this faith, right? There are a lot of places in the world that don't believe that anymore or that think that that's not the only, the one and only true faith. Um, so the, 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 the chapter discusses Maritain's political theological backing of uh, human rights. And it's very interesting the way he, he, he does it because he saw, he was reacting against Nazi Germany, fascism, uh, also the Soviet Union. He was the, one of the first people to see them all left and right as totalitarian. And he understood this really as a kind of fight against what he called empire. And he thought that Jesus, Jesus, Jesus Christ was actually a political thinker because he was fighting the Roman Empire, the pagan empire. Um, and that in a certain sense, Maritain is trying to, uh, this is an old tradition of trying to think of Jesus, not just as a mystical, purely religious figure, but as a political leader of a multitude. Uh, in the book I discussed, but use interpretation of this idea. Um, it's, it's very interesting. It's very widely expanded that, that, that Jesus is really a political revolutionary and he was revolting against empire. So Maritain takes this idea and says, look, Jesus and his teaching, let's call it Christianity, we have to repoliticize Christianity, right? And in so doing, save democracy from totalitarianism. And, and Maritain is the founder of what we call Christian democracy, right? Christian democracy, which has been very successful in the post-war Latin America and Europe at, at holding on to power. Uh, we're just about to witness the last, the end of the last great Christian Democrat, right? Which is Merkel, uh, best leader in the world, easily, hands down. Why? Christian Democratic through and through, right? All of Maritain, basically Merkel is just Maritain realized in, in a certain way. Um, anyways, I don't want to go to, into details, but um, now I do want to say one thing, which is you might ask me, what's the theological basis of uh, human rights and, and this Christian demo democracy? And for Maritain, it's captured in this Pauline idea that all human beings are equal children of God um, and that human rights somehow um, correspond to this idea, all human beings, doesn't matter which religion, your race, your sexuality, your gender, whether you're a child, whether you're an old person, you're all equal children of God, that's the moment transcendence, and this is what gives you, let's say, a, a God-given or a natural-given right to have human rights. This is the political theology of democracy that's behind whenever we try to extend human rights from adults to children, uh, uh, from uh, people uh, uh, of a certain uh, uh, religion to all religions and so on and so forth. We should all have the right to believe what we want and so on and so forth. Anyways, that, that's the, the basis. But of course, it's also uh, a, a problem, right? Uh, and it raises a problem. Do, do human rights need a theological foundation? How does religion work with human rights? 
Uh, and in the book, I try to suggest that uh, the reason why religions entered into the public sphere in the first place, it was, it was not, not, in the, not after the Iranian revolution, so to speak. It, wa it was in the setup of the, of the UN and of uh, human rights, because the importance of religions to legitimize of world religions, what was called world religions, construction of world religions, to legitimize human rights is already inscribed in uh, the UN Charter and in uh, the Declaration of Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So there's a very complicated dance there, which I won't get into, but that's what part of the book is. Uh, where am I? I have two other <laughs> chapters. I don't know. Uh, one is uh, uh, very quickly, uh, the third uh, chapter about this uh, democratic turn of political theology is dedicated to Ernst Kantorovich. Uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with his name. He was a um, historian of medieval uh, times. Also not very well known unless you were into medieval history, but now he's become quite famous for a, a book called The King's Two Bodies. And uh, that's basically a book that, remember at the beginning of my talk, I said, Okay, if you accept the analogy between God is analogous to the state, then the question becomes who represents, who is the political representative of the state? What is a state? What is a state? And so you, you have two ways to think about it. You can go either a monarchic way, that is that you associate the state with some authoritative leader, let's put it that way, that somehow represents all society, or democratically, you associate the state as somehow the representative of all the people. But now the, the question is, Again, we're back to the question of who is this people? How, how do you constitute a people? And this is what Kantorovich, the King's Two Bodies, saying is that in the West, the figure of the king, what's important about it is actually that he is a kind of mystical representative of the mystical body of the people, of the people as a mystical association which has political power and is the basis of all political power. So he's giving us in this book, the kind of political theology that would lead to popular revolutions, to Republican revolutions. And then also in the end, to all those revolutions, which are based on somehow bringing to life the body of the people, yeah? Uh, and these are not only liberal democratic revolutions, the French revolution, the American revolution, but also of course, the Chinese revolution, the Russian revolution, uh, and the Iranian Revolution to a certain degree as well. Um, now, what is interesting about this for, for, for me is that, and the way I read Kantorovich, um, is that actually when you thematize the body of the people in this political theological way, what you're doing is you're actually not gonna come out with a discourse about the state, nor are you gonna come out with a discourse about a constitution, which would be two ways in which you can politically articulate the people. But actually there's a third way, which is government. And what we now call governmentality and governance and all these, all these words. So this is what my thesis is, that, that there is a third way in which the body of the people is brought to life but it's not through a constitution, right? As it was, for example, the American Revolution where we the people, that's the beginning of a constitutional statement. And it's not the French statist way where we the people is the general assembly and ultimately l'état. But it's a third thing, which is what in political science nowadays we call by different terms, governance, governmentality, in general government. And, the chapter is trying to figure out a kind of archaeology of this sense of government, which is not reducible to state nor to uh, a, a, a constitution. And in fact, I, I personally think that what uh, everything of importance these days has to do with that conflict between, let's say, government and governmentality and, and constitutionalism, this, this kind of, uh, but uh, we, we can talk about more. And the final thing is about Habermas and, and Derrida and how they try to work out a political theology of democracy uh, by um, uh, through the category of public reason, right? This idea of, of Rawls that all democratic legitimacy is based on the public use of reason, right? That's the basis of it. 
And then the question is, well, is this public reason atheist or should it allow religious voices? And what is, how important is a religious concepts in this elaboration of public reason? And Rawls said that they were quite important and Haramas says they're extremely important. And why are they extremely important? Well, because democracy and democratic values are essentially underlied by a messianic impulse. And the messianic impulse in two sentences simply, all slavery is illegitimate. There should never be slavery in any kind, of any kind. And, and this is, of course, messianic in, in the sense of, you know, Moses freeing the people from the Egyptians, you know, freeing the slaves, et cetera, et cetera. And you find this in all monotheism, this kind of radical thrust that slavery in a certain sense and also socioeconomic inequality in a secondary sense embody uh, evil and that, that democracy needs this messianic push to, to, to legitimize itself. You know, if democracy is not doing away with oppression, domination, equality, well, what's it doing? That's basically, and if you accept that, then you accept that you need to voice these messianic demands in public reason because they will orient them. And if you don't, then you don't really have a public reason, so on and so forth. That's a little bit how I understand Habermas. All right, I hope this was interesting. I'll stop now. Thanks, Nissan and everybody Thank else. Thank you. Thank you, Miguel. Uh, any questions, Josh? I'm, I'm going to need a minute to let that sink in. Um, brilliant talk. Really enjoyed it. Um, I just, I've got a few ideas, but I'd like to see where it goes. Yeah, go on. Sorry, your son? Uh, yeah. You said you got a few ideas. Do you want to elaborate on that? Um, this isn't um, necessarily on the specific topic. There's so much to digest. And in future, actually, I'd like to see some written work prior to these um, these events to give me and to give others time to really think. Sorry, Josh. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, I suppose one question is, oh, this book's based on your, or this work's, this presentation's based on your 2015 book. And as you were talking, I was thinking about- The 2020 book, the 2020 book. Oh, this is your most recent book. Uh, not the most recent, but the 2020. It's called Divine Democracy, Political Theology After Karl Schmidt. Right, okay. So you've got another one, though, um, on, the, on the Jewish... Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, it just got me thinking about the common Abrahamic sort of um, basis of legitimacy and, and, I suppose, governance and everything else. And I'm just wondering how this might apply. I've seen you approached it and applied it to um, Jewish thought. How how this might work in Islamic democracies? Yeah, that's an excellent question. You know, uh, originally I had thought of doing also Islam, but you know, I don't, I don't, the languages fail me and I just, uh, my, my mind is not, uh, I, I just can't take all of it. So I, I do work on it a little bit from, from uh, yeah. And, and in the book about Jewish political theology, as it turns out, um, uh, Jewish medieval thought, which is central to this, is so dependent on uh, Islamic and Arabic uh, medieval thought that in the end, that book is also kind of a little bit about, about that, but not, not entirely. So I think the big difference here within the three Abrahamic is that a, in uh, the Christian setup, the idea of representation is absolutely central. It comes from the idea that somehow the church is a, is a representative body. And, and part of what Kantorovich and Schmidt are trying to say, and now it's become, everybody accepts it, is that modern liberal democratic representative organs, for example, like a parliament, originally uh, uh, come out of conciliarism, right? The council of the church as a real representative body there that then elects the Pope, but not the, the Pope is not like divinely connected to God. It's the council that is, as it were, receptive of God, and then they elect the Pope and so on. So a lot of people, Francis Oakley is the most famous one, have worked a genealogy of modern liberal parliamentarianism from, um, from this. Now, the way I think about it is that in the Jewish and in the uh, Islamic uh, dash Arabic tradition, this understanding of representation is not so central. And rather, paradoxically or not paradoxically, what they are 
the usefulness of this tradition would be more to think about something which we would call direct democracy rather than representative democracy or indirect democracy. So the figure of the charismatic leader uh, and therefore also the prophet becomes fundamental. Now, in my argument, in these traditions, the prophet is at the same time, of course, the lawgiver. So, you know, the law is fundamental. And, and, and I think that, um, you know, just like Schmidt says, when you, when you push a lot on the representative function, it's very easy to end up uh, in a, in a, in a, in a, with a politics that is all about uh, um, ex uh, going beyond the law. Right. And I think that this is the corrective that properly interpreted Islamic and Jewish political theology can give back. That is a kind of correction to this tendency of, uh, of going very um, uh, extra legal, let's put it this way. Thank but it's you. a complicated, it's a complicated thing. Yes. Thank you, Miguel. Uh, there are a few comments in the chat room. I'll come to those. But first, Stephen, you raise the hand. Thank you. This is a really fascinating paper. I'm just talking my, trying to orientate myself, I think, with the, the theological uh, aspects to it. I guess my, my question is essentially, if we know that anarchists are uh, kind of the atheists in this uh, metaphysical picture, who are the true believers? Are they, is, is, is it conservatism? Is it fascism? Is it something that far? Or, and I guess the question for me, a bit self-interested question is where does Republican kind of thought and also to a certain degree liberal thought fit into this cosmology as well? Yes. Thanks. That's a great question. So yes, in a way, of course. So let's let's assume that the anarchists are the atheists, right? And they're also the party of disorder, of against mm -hmm. order. So then the, the fascists were all about like we want to bring order back. And in a certain sense, we are the true believers. But uh, the problem is you have to truly believe that, that, that Hitler is the leader or, or, or the true leader, the true representative of what is God or what is transcendent and so on. And, and um, basically what you have is then a, what's called, technically speaking, a political religion. And that's what Fergland's first book, important book, was called Political Religions. And he thought all totalitarian governments were political religions because they... Uh, reduce transcendence into the figure of the political leader, right? So you can think of that as true believers. But my whole, the whole point of the book is to show that immediately Fergley, Mary Tan, and everybody else says, no, the true believers are the believers in the democratic credo, right. the democratic faith. This is not anarchism and it's not fascism, yeah? And, and basically, if you're a true believer in democracy, you have to believe in, essentially, for Mary Tan, uh, human rights, that that becomes the fundamental category. Um, okay, so, um, you know, and, uh, and that is what brings, I think, religion into this question of democratic legitimacy in the end. You know, what, what, what do people who support democracy have to believe in, right? Uh, and now some people are horrified, liberals who take roles too literally or the first roles in hand say, you don't have to believe in anything, we, you know, uh, you have to believe in, in neutrality from religion, uh, but that's not a belief that's rationally based. It's on based on science or on our uh, public use of reason without any reference to any theological concept and so on and so forth. But that's, that's, uh, that's, that, is, that is bankrupt today. It's bankrupt today, obviously, because, uh, you know, uh, the belief in science is itself yeah, people say, yeah, you've got to believe in science, and science is a faith. <laughs> and so we have the whole vaccine, anti-vaxxers and everything else, right? Um, so, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a mess. It's a mess. Public reasons become a mess. You know, what, what do true believers in democracy have to believe? Now, yeah, I agree that that, that was a big question for republicanism. That's what my next book on Friday, I'm going to be talking about that civil religion. <laughs> That's the Republican answer to this question. You know, what, what do you have to believe in to be a Democrat? Lance, uh, do you want to ask your question here? Can you hear me? Oh uh, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. I just have a question about um, if you if you can see uh, any similarities between. Uh, th there are certain interests that were uh, in 
modern Chinese intelligentsia. Yeah. So can you can you see any parallels uh, or connections or similarities between this uh, trend in modern Chinese intelligentsia with uh, interwar Germany uh, leading up to World War II? Thanks. Are you, are you referring to what I said about Schmidt being read a lot in China these days? Well, I think the reason that the Schmidt that has been read is not so much the Schmidt I'm talking about. It's the Schmidt after World War II, when he writes a book called the, the Nomos or the Law of the Earth. And he starts to think about politics in planetary terms, which is now so uh, uh, a la mode, right? Because everybody's thinking planetary. But the first one, as Chuck Krabarty, his last book uh, admits, the first one to do so is, is Carl Schmidt. And, and, and Carl Schmidt was uh, uh, not a multilateralist. He, he thought that the UN system would lead to what he what actually uh, uh, Sam Moyne is saying now in the op-ed, which is a permanent state of war uh, by drones and this kind of stuff. Actually, Sam Moyne in, in the op-ed is voicing a Schmidtian position, but he doesn't want to admit it. And so for Schmidt, the solution was not, not this kind of one world around one charter of human rights, but to break up the world in these uh, great spaces, what he called great spaces. Uh, of which one could be Europe, another one could be whatever, the US, another, you know, Soviet Union, Russia, and of course, China. And that's, that's, the, that's what's getting people in Moscow and Beijing very excited. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think I thought um, I'm not too deep into, into these um, political philosophies, but I thought one thing that can motivate um, Beijing was his I, 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 I know Carl Schmidt to be a famous critic of Western liberal democracy. So of I course, think of course, that's one too. of the major motivations. Absolutely. And also dictatorial powers for the state and state of exception. These of are course. fancy, fancy things for authoritarians all over the world. <laughs> and actually, in Turkey, I talk about in my new book. Uh, Erdogan's ed, one of his advisors. He openly talks about Schmidtian ideas. Uh, so openly, without any. It's issue. very popular everywhere. <laughs> and politics as is, uh, is an issue of friends and for even internal uh, enemies, etc. Yeah. yeah. Uh, John. If, if that's me, that's not a question. That's just an ex cathedra yeah, observation. Yeah, go on. Hey. No, it's a, it's a side note about whether human rights really matters to the UN. I don't think it's central to the UN's functioning, but that's, you no, know, it's not even a footnote in this discussion, I don't think. I don't think human rights matters in Miguel's argument, but maybe it does. <laughs> well, they do insofar as uh, I think that the attempt to um, legitimize democracy as opposed to totalitarianism quote unquote, quote unquote, uh, after the war, it passes through a struggle for human rights. And I still, uh, I think, I think Maritain is, is a kind of a prophet in, of that, right? And, he, and talking about prophecy, he explicitly says that to fight for human rights, you would need to have uh, a, pro a prophetic avant-garde uh, that is essentially uh, civil society organizations around uh, human rights. And that these would push the fight, not state and government, right? Um, um, because human rights are, are anti-sovereignty, um, and so uh, and, and this 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 has led to uh, you know, Médecins uh, Sans uh, Frontières and you know, Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, all all of these uh, uh, civil society organizations, NGOs, etc., that are working for human rights. Um, are motivated by, by this kind of uh, political theology of, of human rights and of democracy that Mary Tan put forward. That's my thesis, yeah. Evelyn, uh, do you want to tell us what you wrote here in the chat room? Are you still here? Yes, I am here. Yes, I, I just thank you very much. I've, uh, I found your lecture very, uh, very thought provoking and it, it's given me a lot of uh, thoughts. Um, I do a lot of work in human rights 
And uh, I must say that my personal experience with the United Nations is that uh, we're very good at talking about human rights and not so good at protecting them. And governments are doing that. And uh, the United Nations and the High Commission somehow seems to have become almost like a filter rather than a channel for prosecuting human rights. It's a sad story and uh, it's, it's a regrettable story. And I'm, I'm sort of wondering whether you know, this, uh, it, it seems to me terribly hypocritical that we keep on harping back to uh, the example of Jesus, for example, uh, and religion, where it's inspired some very good trends in humanity, and we use them to justify some disasters. <laughs> we really need to do a lot more work in thinking why it is we do what we do. It seems to me that maybe Schmidt has got, uh, uh, he's got some of the answers, however, unpalatable they are. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. Any other questions? <clears throat> uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Miguel. That was fascinating. Maybe we need to have another session. But you are having one with police, yes? A few days later? Yes, I think on Friday I'm talking about civil yeah. religion. Yeah, a civil religion. Yeah, it's again no slides, so yeah. be prepared. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so Thank next you so month, much, Isan. I really yeah. enjoyed it. Thank you. Next month on the fourth of October, we'll uh, listen to Philip Slowski. He is a new book published by Cambridge University Press, "Remaking of Ukraine After the Second World War," and you'll you'll get the invitations for that uh, uh, as well. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you bye very bye. much. Bye bye.